about two weeks ago, the Three Muslims YouTube channel made a reaction video to a reaction video. This reaction video they reacted to was Ruslan reacting to a video I did on Andrew Tate and polygamy. They've titled the video something like a Christian apologist uh, accuses Andrew Tate of this and gets a shocking dose of reality. Plenty of people have asked me to respond to it and I've wanted to respond to it because they make a number of claims in there. And so here it goes. Get ready, buckle up, and here we go. As we get started, I want to start with a Bible passage. And this is wisdom literature, and it is just the case. It's true. The Bible in Proverbs 18, 17 says, The one who states his case first seems right, until the other comes and examines him. This is generally wisdom we should take whenever we interact with individuals and watch videos on the internet. Well, the wisdom here would be that we get a second opinion, that we examine what that was that was said. And that's exactly what we're going to do as we react to the three Muslims channel and their video about me. We're going to run through most of their claims. Um, and I've chopped this up a little bit. So for the full video, you can go click in the description box and go to their channel and check out what they said. I've tried not to leave much out. I've, I'm dealing with most of the points uh, that they bring up. Andrew Tate had the ability at least to get with a lot of different women. Why on earth? Would he want to get married to a limit limitation of four? So the first claim is why would Andrew Tate want to limit himself and get married to four women when he could have a limitless amount of women? And I realize this is conjecture on my part, but let me just entertain you here. I've worked with people pastorally for more than 10 years now. One of the things I've realized is that people generally will want to justify themselves. By that, I mean they want to come out as they're morally justified for the things that they're doing. My claim in this video was that Andrew Tate going around unmarried uh, as a bachelor, and he's made claims that he's maybe not, but uh, going around and sleeping with different women is generally still seen as wrong, especially from the Christian perspective. This is fornication, and the Muslims would agree with this. And one of the ways you can justify being with multiple women is by actually getting married to them. But Christianity doesn't allow that. You can't ever go to a church and ask to get married to multiple women. What does justify that? Islam. The idea here is a justification that he would bring into the situation. Not just, I have the freedom to sleep around with whomever I want to sleep around with. I agree with that. He could do that. I think what he wants to do is justify his pre-existing views, his pre-existing views about aggression, his pre-existing views about polygamy, his pre-existing views on whatever it may be that in this case, Islam would agree with. That was the point in that video. If you look at Abraham, he had two wives. If you look at uh, Solomon in the Bible, he had 300 wives. It's like, why are you acting like there's no such thing as, as a multitude of wives in, in the Bible at all? This is one of those things that is all over the comment section on my videos. Solomon had many wives. Abraham had many wives. David had many wives. I'm not acting like the Bible actually doesn't say it. As a matter of fact, I've made a video on this talking about why those individuals were wrong. And the Bible actually didn't teach that they could have more than one wife. They were in the wrong. So I'm, I'm not ignoring this fact. And the simple response to this is that people in the Bible make wrong decisions. They do wrong things. And if you want to check out that video that I made on this, just click here on this video and then go check it out. Let's move on to the third point. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. You know, like we, we should we should look at what Jesus said, right? The actual gospel. But the thing is, is that the actual gospel can't be found. The actual gospel, it's been, it's been lost. What we have today is just like this butchering of things that we don't even know what's real, what's not real. What, what Jesus, peace be upon him, said and what he didn't say. It's like the book that you showed me, bro. The book yeah. where you have the actual New Testament scholars. They looked at it and they said, okay, this is what he said. This is what he might have said. This is what he definitely didn't say. Okay, this is another one of those Muslim talking points that the actual gospel has been lost. The good news, that's what the gospel means. And we know it's been lost because Muhammad told us it's been lost, even though Christians were practicing Christianity for 700 years before Muhammad came around and made a claim that the gospel has been changed and perverted and lost. And what he's going to tell us is the real gospel. This is not proof by any sense of the word. This is just a claim. Has the gospel actually been lost? Meaning the gospel message. Repent and believe. That's how you become Christian. 
this is what the teachings of the New Testament are. The earlier evidence we have of Christianity is there. It's hundreds of years before Muhammad comes around. So why should we trust a later source when we have a lot of earlier sources that we should trust? Now, this video is going to move into a space where we're going to be talking about the Jesus Seminar. And one of the things we're going to do is use the criteria that the Jesus Seminar uses against Christianity and be fair about it and use it against Islam. So let's hear the argument first from the Jesus Seminar, and then we'll respond to it. Show them, bro. Let them have it. This is the book. There it is. The Five Gospels by the Jesus Seminar. It has a multitude of New Testament scholars. You see there's there's a, big, a bit of gray, a bit of black, a bit of pink. So they put in uh, red letters things Jesus most likely said. They put in pink letters like here things he probably said. They put in gray letters like here things he probably didn't say. And they put in bold black things Jesus definitely did not say. And when you flip through the book, so when you flip through the book, What's the, the majority? It's mostly black, bro. It's mostly black, which means most of the things in the New Testament, and to be fair, it's the five Gospels, including the Gospel of Thomas, which Christians don't see as canonical. You can see most of the things that are narrated are, have nothing to do with Jesus, and they're not what Jesus said. Here's a book, The Five Gospels by the Jesus Seminar. New Testament scholars. Well, kind of, sort of. A number of them, a number of the leading ones, would be considered reputable New Testament scholars. The Jesus Seminar altogether, their entire group, and this number is a little bit old, so some of them might have died already, is about 200 people. So there are thousands and thousands of New Testament scholars who disagree with the findings of the Jesus Seminar. Now, some people might not be aware of the Jesus Seminar and their writings and what their case is, but those of us who've been doing this for some time, uh, studied it in school, we looked at their writings, we dealt with their presuppositions. Here's one of the things that the Jesus Seminar folks believe. They're atheistic naturalists, the whole lot of them, meaning they don't agree and they don't accept anything supernatural. So they bring that into their New Testament studies. So when they're reading the New Testament, they will look at anything in there that is supernatural or claims that it's supernatural and off the bat reject it because supernatural things don't happen because naturalism is true and atheism is true. That's why most of the stuff in the New Testament is in black, not because of any other reason. I thought we could do the same thing when it comes to the Quran. We could take claims in the Quran and use that same exact criteria. To my understanding, the whole miracle of Islam is that it was miraculously revealed to Muhammad because Muhammad was an illiterate individual and this very beautiful poetic writing was revealed to him and was dictated to him. So let's use the Jesus Seminar's standards. So if the New Testament says Mary had a visitation from the angel Gabriel who told her that she's going to give birth to Jesus, the Jesus Seminar would say, nope, didn't happen. It's not real history because there's a miracle in there. Hmm. It seems to me by that logic, we'd have to eliminate the entire Quran, not even a part of it, because the entire thing is dictation from the angel to Muhammad. If I were to pick up a book and say, look, I got a book here from Islamic scholars, but the Islamic scholars I'm quoting from are atheistic naturalists who completely reject anything miraculous from the Quran. Would that be fair? See, this is the problem when it comes to individuals watching videos like this who don't know about the Jesus Seminar, who don't know what these guys' beliefs are, who don't know the counter arguments to the Jesus Seminar. A number of people have written books against them, calling them out because of their presuppositions and reading their presuppositions into their studies. In reality, nobody really takes the Jesus Seminar very seriously anymore. They take another scholar serious, and he's a real scholar, Bart Ehrman who we're going to be talking about next. Uh, so someone like, I know Christians maybe don't like Bart Ehrman, but he is a New Testament scholar. He's done debates with other New Testament scholars. You can go watch those. He mentions that there is a unanimous agreement. There is the, a unanimous opinion that the, the originals will not be found. And New Testament scholars stopped using the term originals, original gospels, because they know it will not be found. I like Bart Ehrman, as a matter of fact. I don't agree with him, but I like him. There's a fault. False equivalency here a little bit, talking about the originals and then the original gospels and then the original gospel, meaning the message, the good news. Bart Ehrman, and he's right about this, says that the original manuscripts that the disciples wrote cannot be found. But Bart Ehrman doesn't say that the message of the disciples of Jesus cannot be found, as these gentlemen are claiming. You guys see that? It's like a bait and switch. The original manuscripts versus the original 
message because the original manuscripts have been copied over and over and multiplied and shared all throughout the world. So the message is there. As a matter of fact, Bart Ehrman says that the message of the resurrection of Jesus found in 1 Corinthians, there's a little hymn there that talks about Jesus dying and rising from the dead, is anywhere from two weeks to two years after the actual death of Jesus. Here's another thing Bart Ehrman says, that Jesus actually died. So if we're going to use that same standard and quote Bart Ehrman on this because he's a scholar on the subject, then that completely disagrees with the Islamic claim that Jesus never died. So Bart Ehrman would definitely disagree with that statement that Jesus never died. Next, let's talk about the gospel, the good news, actually listening to Jesus, because there's a point here that's made that I, th I think is very interesting. We should, we should be following what Jesus, peace be upon him, was actually preaching. But the thing is, is that, again, what he originally preached has been altered. It can no longer be found. We don't know exactly what he was saying during that time. But what we did know is exactly what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said. Okay, th there seems to be a little problem here. The claim is that we should follow everything Jesus said, but we don't have and we don't know what it was that Jesus originally said. But we know what Jesus really said because Muhammad told us what Jesus really said. This is sort of like that friend that you have that says America has the greatest weapons on the earth and they're all in secret and nobody knows about it except him. And, oh, it's been lost. We don't know what it was. But Muhammad told us what it was. And by the way, what he told us what it was disagreed with the previous six, seven hundred years of history where Christians were teaching, preaching, all this stuff. This next point, I have to be honest, I'm a little confused about as to what is trying to be said. Listen, if Christianity, if Christianity was the final religion, if Christianity was exactly what it was supposed to be, if it truly is Christianity, if we're truly supposed to accept Jesus as our savior and repent to him and all this stuff, why is it that there has been a final testament, right? The final testament, which is the Quran, the final religion, which is Islam, and it preaches the exact same message that all the Abrahamic faiths have been preaching from the beginning, except without alteration. Okay, the claim is if Christianity's really the revelation from God, why would there be a need for a final revelation, which is the Quran? Well, you realize that Christians don't think the Quran is actually a revelation from God. This is circular reasoning. So you, you cannot say if Christianity is the real deal, why was there a need of Islam and the Quran being revealed? Because you're assuming the Quran is actually the truth that's been revealed and Christianity has been changed. So you're leading your conclusion into your assumptions. Th this is just faulty thinking. It, this is not an argument. It's, it's actually pretty bad. So let's not do this, guys. Now, there's a question that's going to be added here by Rami, and uh, we, we will respond to this question. I think uh, as an additive, I want to add a question. Islam very clearly deals with Christianity. It does. In the Quran, the Hadith of the Prophet it very clearly deals with Christianity, Judaism, polytheism, basically every mainstream understanding of life that exists. I'd say every understanding of life, it deals with it in some way. Christianity has no explanation for Islam other than, well, it's just the devil, the work of the devil trying to misguide people. Okay, They have nothing concrete, nothing solid as an argument against Islam or against the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Even when you look at the Bible, like in Deuteronomy, I think it's 23, I'm not sure. But when you look at Deuteronomy, it says that essentially gives a criteria that you can tell if a prophet is a true prophet by his prophecies. So you're going to tell me that's in the Bible and then God's going to allow a man to come to make like hundreds of prophecies and basically all of them come true. And then we still have to reject him as a prophet, even though in the Bible it says if his prophecies are true, then he's a true prophet. He's spoken the truth. Come on, there's, there's, there's many, many shortcomings. Okay, there's two claims that's made here. Uh, number one, Christian doesn't deal with Islam. Number two, Muhammad should be trusted because his prophecies are true. Christianity doesn't deal with Islam because Islam didn't exist. As a matter of fact, Islam doesn't exist in the New Testament times. Islam doesn't exist when the New Testament's being written. So why would it be dealing with it? I just, again, this is, this is a bad argument. 
it's really not an argument. Christianity dealt with things, the New Testament dealt with things that were around and trying to influence the church in certain ways, like Gnosticism or pre-Gnostic ideas like Docetism that's found in First John or Colossians. But I would say that Christianity does deal with Islam in the general sense of the word. So if Jesus resurrected from the dead and Islam is false because Islam says Jesus never died. So by deduction, Christianity deals with Islam, but it doesn't directly deal with Islam because when the New Testament was being written, Islam was not around. Now, in regards to Muhammad making prophecies and the bible says that you know if, if a prophet makes prophecies and they come true you got to trust them i don't want to go into, into the details of whether something's a prophecy or something is not what i would just say is is there anything muhammad got wrong if there's one thing muhammad got wrong it doesn't even have to be a prophecy it's just anything that he gets wrong then he's a false prophet because the idea in islam is that all this stuff is being dictated to him by god and god since he's all-knowing being cannot get anything wrong even if it's to represent the false views of others. So you got to represent their false views correctly. Well, Muhammad said that Jesus never died. All the early sources tell us Jesus died. All the scholars tell us Jesus died. If we look at someone like Bart Ehrman that we were talking about, he very clearly believes Jesus died. And if Muhammad got that wrong, then he's a false prophet. Our brother is going to share something about Christianity that um, he sees off or wrong. And he actually claims to be a former Christian. I don't know this gentleman. I don't know what that would have been like, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So let's check out what he has to say. And I think the last thing that I want to say in regards to um, Christianity as a whole, in my experience, this is my experience, okay? It's not the 100% of the truth um, that, that I would say, right? But from what I noticed is that most Christians, right, they'll say that they're Christian and they'll stick to that. They'll stand by that uh, because they're just attached. They're attached to it and it's their ego, the ego attachment. They, and they can't let go of the ego. They can't submit the ego fully and actually submit themselves. Like 100%. Again, and I say that from my experience, bro. Yeah. Because every, every Christian that I've come across, even myself when I was Christian, like they don't submit. I didn't submit, bro. I can't say I ever fully submitted to God. And it's like, yeah, I had we all had those moments where like we, you know, things times are getting really rough. We feel really low, and we get into those moments where like, oh, um, we feel more humble and we're getting closer to God. But it's it's not till you fully submit yourself that you really, really get close to God, really experience God, bro. and that really only happens when you practice as a Muslim. Why? Because it's it's the exact proper guidelines right as a christian there aren't really the guidelines so the claim here is that christians don't really want to submit themselves to god and they're just doing it because of their ego pride so they don't want to change they don't want to become muslims i assume the assumption here is because of ego maybe there's a better way to formulate this that a lot of people are just used to their religion and therefore they're unwilling to change it the same thing could be said of islam and muslims there are many many muslims in the world that will not leave Islam. And it's not because they're devoted Muslims, they're committed Muslims. It's because that's all they know. It's because anything else is different. I mean, this is just the case with Buddhists. I mean, this is just the case. Another issue with this is that it's a hasty generalization that is like, oh, it's because Christians are proud. It's not an argument. It's just a statement and an assumption about people. As a matter of fact, you can up one this by saying, why do you think it is that people aren't leaving Islam? Especially in Muslim majority countries that uh, that's ruled by Sharia. Oh, because they get punished for it. They get punished for it by their families. They get punished by it legally. Even if it's not legal, there could be groups that come out and hurt them physically. So people are scared to leave Islam. So I'm not sure what kind of experience our, our friend here has had in regards to Christianity. I assume he was the sort of Christian that I was for 17 years of my life, right? Like a very nominal Christian, not an actual Christian, not someone who actually followed the Bible, not someone who actually did what the Bible said, understood what the text taught. It was just kind of culturally there. That's my assumption. I, I don't think I'm wrong, but we'll just put it out there. He's going to go on to talk about prayer a little bit, and I want to address that point as well. As Christians, they, they really only pray like when... But like Sunday service, maybe, oh, I'm about to eat. Let me say a prayer before I eat. Um, Maybe before going to sleep or something like that. Or maybe they might only pray like when times are hard and they want to ask for like things to be easy or help or, or something like this, right? You can't, you can't fully connect with God 
if that's how you're praying. Like, so this is a comment that I've gotten in my comment section as well. Muslims saying, you Christians, you know, you don't, you're not really committed to God. You only pray once a week or once a day or, you know, before you eat or something. But we pray five times a day. My response very simply to this is the New Testament teaches us to pray without ceasing. That's an actual teaching in the Bible to always and continuously pray. Actual Christians, real Christians are constantly and always in conversation with God. I talk to God throughout the day, at all times, in all places, regardless of what I'm doing, because I'm constantly talking to God. Now, this is another fallacy. This is another hasty generalization. Oh, Christians do this. No, no. You are taking a certain group and applying it to everyone else. It would be the same if I were to take any nominal Muslim that just really doesn't care about Islam. It's very disobedient, but is called a Muslim because of his ethnicity and ancestry. And then say, man, these Muslims, they don't care about anything. They say that uh, you can't eat pork and you can't drink alcohol. But look, here they are eating pork and drinking alcohol. They're such hypocrites. That would be quite unfair, I think, in a conversation like this. So again, guys, let's not use this kind of thinking. Finally, I want to put the offer back out there because Rami said, hey, he, he, he finds us genuine, me and Ruslan. And um, I can at least speak for myself. If you guys want to have a sit down and, and talk, do a live stream together or something like that, I'm, I'm more than willing to do that. I want to thank you guys for watching this. I appreciate you guys. Make sure that you hit that like button and that subscribe button and come back for more videos like this and just things that impact Christianity, Christian apologetics, and culture in general. Take care. God bless you. And I will see you in the next video.